Okay, so let's uh, sort of recap what we saw uh, in the last lesson uh, and see what we have to deal with. Um, so by defining what we have with Hooke's law. So um, when we uh, so when we apply uh, so uh, tensile or compressive. forces to an object, uh, we can alter its shape. Okay, so you either, you know, compress something, you make it squish it, you make it smaller, tensile is when you're stretching something, you make it uh, larger. Uh, and what we're saying with that is that, um, you know, that happens with any material, you know, pretty much. As long as you're able to apply the force big enough to sort of like deform it, then you'll deform it. And then actually you can argue you'll deform things even very small amounts. Um, but if you are dealing with a with certain classes of materials, certain class of materials follow Hooke's law. Okay, and that is where the um the alteration of the shape or the extension is directly proportional to the force you've applied. Um so Materials that follow Hooke's law will have a deformation. So which we're going to call an extension, which could really be you could get a negative extension, which means you've squished or something. Uh, that is directly uh, proportional. to the applied force. And that is summed up through the relationship that F is directly proportional to the extension, which gives us F equals K. Force and Newtons. Um, this is called the spring or the force constant to the Newtons per meter, and you've got the extension measured in meters. If your extension is measured in centimeters, you would have a force constant measured in Newtons per centimeter. Um, and if it obviously, if you're not dealing with a spring, you do, you call it the force constant. So the two terms are, so a spring constant, a special version of force constant. You'll see the two terms used quite a lot, mostly because, um, mostly because we normally just demonstrate this with springs, but as we'll see, hopefully when we return and we get the chance to do it in the lab, you can apply this to other things that don't have, that are not springs. So what we can see from this is that um, the force is what you apply, the extension is the outcome. So if we think about what that means, um, so as uh, the extension is equal to the force you apply divided by the force constant, uh, this tells us that the greater the force constant uh, the stiffer the object. So stiffness is a measurement in physics. It's got a specific meaning in physics and in engineering. If something is stiff, it means that you have to apply a greater force to get a particular extension. So there is a meaning to something being stiff in physics. And there's many words that come up in engineering, uh, strong or tough. They have specific meanings. Stiffness is about 
how much does something extend when you give it a when you apply force and it's measured through um, the force constant the greater that is the less extension you'll get if you apply say 10 newtons 100 newtons whatever it is um, you know so uh, k can be calculated from the gradient of a force extension. Graph. So we get is there's force, there's extension, and if we get uh, that our gradient Now, at this point, I'm not worried about going beyond the elastic limit. I'm staying completely in a region of Hooke's law because we've got a linear line. But if we had something where the gradient was like this, this is a uh, stiffer material. So something's been built and designed in a certain way that we apply a certain force, we get less extension out of it. Um, as an interesting aside, actually, um, and this is not something you deal with so much at the A-level, is this graph feels backwards. Because when you do the experiment, it feels like you add forces, you add weights to the to the spring, and you measure an extension. So it feels like you should be doing this the other way. It feels like the, the things are wrong. Um, and what actually is being measured in, in the way that engineers think about it is they actually think about it as a this force is called a restoring force it is the pullback. So it's this idea of if you stretch a spring by five centimetres, what is the pullback force as a consequence of doing that? And that's just kind of a, a, a way in which they've been thinking about stuff. So they, um, you might see in some textbooks that actually uh, they write it, and this is not really, you don't really do it at A-level, but you might see in some places they write it as F is equal to minus Kx. And that's because what they're measuring there is the uh, restoring force that's in the spring. So it's a negative because it's trying to pull back. But that's not something you need to know about for the A-level. But it is why this graph is backwards seeming. So um, what we can do is we can consider uh, the, uh, the concept of springs in um, series and parallel. So what do we get when we um, stretch things in when we add springs together in a line? And what do we get when we sort of hook them up in parallel? And hopefully the answer to that made sense. When they're in parallel, they start sharing the load. You don't stretch as much. When they're in series, they stretch a lot more. And uh, what we can do is we can actually work out an effective spring constant as a consequence of doing those things, which we'll do now. Now, when we connect things in series and parallel, what we find is that that has an effect on what we call the effective uh, so spring constant. So I'm going to define something which is called the, this is sort of the um, effective spring constant of the system. And um, the sort of the shorthand answer is that, you know, when you connect uh, springs in parallel, so for springs in parallel, the effective um, stiffness is greater. Okay, and that is made sense from the thing if you think, well, if I go from having a system where I've got my uh, thing there and I've got um, spring one and I've got my second spring, 
and there's my sort of force that I'm pulling down on it. Um, my force is now split across two springs. So, so each spring uh, you know, takes less force, so extend less. You know, which ultimately is this thing is not going to extend more. And that should make sense because in any situation, if you're trying to support a load, for example, if you add an extra pillar, that should make it easier to support the load. Things wouldn't break. So if you're trying to support something, you add more pillars. If you're trying to do some of this, you would add more springs. You're sharing the load across. Uh, and that is how it is. Um, now for for identical springs, the effective constant is doubled. So if we have um, these things, say, let's say that has a, a spring constant of k, and this is also, and they're identicals, so they've both got an individual spring constant of k. So, you know, the, the effective you know, system is equal to two times the initial thing. And if that was three times, that would be tripled. Four times, quadrupled. The more springs you add, the less the system will extend because you're sharing out that force over more and more things. Now, for a spring series, a spring series in series, have I written this? Uh, so, so springs connected in series will ha um, be less stiff overall. So there will be a greater extension for a given load. Now, why does that happen? Well, if we do our system, we have our spring one, and then we have spring two. They each have a spring constant of k. We then apply our weight, our force downwards. We here, because they aren't being able to share the weight, they're each getting, they are each experiencing the force f. So um, they each they experience the full force. Um, so each will extend uh, normally, um, and you end up you add these together. So you've applied one force and you've stretched both springs by the same amount they would have stretched normally, which means you've now got a much greater extension. So that gives us an outcome where the uh, four identical springs the um, effective spring constant will half. So, you know, so in this case, uh, you know, our effective spring constant here will be the individual ones over two. If there were three springs in series, it would be over three and over four and over five and so on and so forth and so forth. So as you make a longer spring, it will actually extend more. Um, now you do not need to know 
the derivations of these things, but I am going to make a separate little video which takes you through actually where they are derived from. And so you can see it, well, what happens if the two springs are different? So if you're interested in seeing how we derive sort of these outcomes, if we have different springs, then feel free to pause this video at this point and go and have a look at that. But otherwise, we're going to look forward to um, work. OK, so let's see if we've got um, how we can extend this to try and work out how much work we've done in stretching a spring. And therefore, we can work out how much elastic potential energy it is storing. So let's consider a spring and let's give it some properties. Let's say that it has a spring constant of not 30, sorry, 25. I have my numbers as nice. So we've got 25 newtons uh, per meter. And let's say that we have um, stretched it, we've got an extension of let's say uh, let's say uh, 0 0.4 meters now since f is equal to kx we can do 25 times 0.4 that tells us that the force that we're applying to this at this point in time is 10 newtons quite nice and easy so we've applied a 10 newton force and we want to know um, what is the work done well if you think about the equation um, work is force times distance you might say well okay I've got a force of 10 newtons I've got a distance of 0 0.4 meters so I would therefore have done four joules of work but unfortunately that is incorrect Why is that incorrect? Well, it's because our force is not constant throughout the process. Okay, so force is not constant. Throughout. So let's say, well, what, you know, because you can ask yourself a question you're saying, okay, um, what would happen if I've only stretched it 0 0.1 meters? Well, at that point, I've only having to do at that point two and a half newtons of force. I don't have to apply so much force. So as I continue to stretch the spring, I have to apply more and more force to get the next centimetre, get the next metre or whatever it is that I'm trying to do. So and that's because we get, and we can see that with um, the force extension graph because we have uh, pens turned off we have a straight line so given that our force is going up as our extension is going up what we're actually interested in is what is the average so we need to first ask the question of what is the average force we have applied Well, um, if we end up here, which is 10, and we started here, which is 0, hopefully you can see, well, the average of, um, of 10 plus 0 over 2 is just 5 newtons. My average force is 5, because over the course of this sort of thing here if I stretch to here hopefully you can sort of appreciate that for approximately given this is a, about half of my stretching procedure uh, I've been applying less than five newtons and for the other half I've been applying more than five newtons and because it's linear I'm going to have an equal amount on either side so my average force in this case is five newtons and that is something that I can apply more generally OK, so um, for a spring obeying 
Hooke's law, the average force applied is F over 2. And this means that we can therefore say, so, the work done is equal to F average times the distance we go, so we get a half of the final force times the displacement. So the work done is a half Fx. And that work is stored as elastic potential energy. It's stored within the spring. This is the equation for elastic potential energy. It's a half Fx. Now this is a equation that applies for anything following Hooke's law. Okay, um, if you're not following Hooke's law, then uh, we have to think slightly more carefully. Before we um, sort of go into more detail, we can also sort of change this equation slightly. Um, we don't even need to sit there always working out the force each time. Okay, so if you know the force, you know the extension, great. But what if you just know the spring constant and you know how much you want to extend something by and you think, how much energy is that going to take? Um, we can also substitute in. So as F equals Kx, we can substitute this in to get elastic potential energy is equal to a half Fx. And as F equals Kx, put that in, we get a half k x squared. And these are the two equations that come in the formula book and they're sort of like they're written like that. So we can return back to our question here. We had a force, the final force of 10 newtons. We had an extension of 0 0.4 meters. What is the work done? So in terms of our example, so in our example, the uh, elastic potential energy is a half times 10 times 0 0.4 and that equals 2 joules. 2 joules of elastic potential energy stored in that particular spring. Um, now the thing to also remember about a half fx, what feature of the graph is a half fx? Well for those of you who uh, remember the delights of um, of velocity time graphs, well, a half fx is the area of this triangle. So, graphically, so graphically, the energy stored is equal to the area under the force. Extension graph. And what is better about the graphical method is that that actually will apply. Um, this applies even if the graph is not linear. So even if the um, thing you're stretching, and we'll look at them with rubber bands and various other things, even if they're not linear, uh, that area under the graph, so even if you have something which behaved a bit like that, if you were able to do the area under the graph and I'm going to make this um, so we can have two so one for a nice linear one 
there's F, there's X. So the area, you know, so that red is the energy stored. So for uh, material that's not following Hooke's law, if the same logic will apply in the same way that for a, uh, a, a velocity time graph with a constant acceleration, you've got a triangle, fantastic, you can do a half uh, times the, you know, a half times the final velocity, you know, uh, times the time, you can see the triangle in that if there's a constant one. But if it's a curve, you have to just start like dealing with the overall area under the graph. But the area under the graph is the work that's being done. Uh, we can't use the equations if we've got this sort of secondary type of graph because, you know, it doesn't quite mean the same thing to have an average in quite the same way. And also that it's clearly not a spring, so there's no spring constant. But we will um, look at uh, what we can learn as we look a bit more at these graphs. But this is how we can work out the work done. That's how we can store the elastic potential energy. And what's nice is that we can actually use this to do some conversion things so we can actually start to convert between elastic potential energy and say kinetic energy or gravitational potential energy so if you wind something up and ping them and let them go but we'll look at those sort of examples um, a little bit later